Welcome to Poetic Lines, where writers make the language sing. Today I'm delighted to welcome Lloyd Schwartz, an award-winning poet, professor, and music critic. Lloyd won the Pulitzer Prize for Criticism in 1994 when he was the classical music editor for the esteemed Boston Phoenix. Yet despite that honor and an impressive resume, Lloyd describes himself not as an expert, but as an advocate for the reader, an opinionated advocate with something important to say. That something takes different forms depending on his audience, yet in each case it involves the act of listening. At UMass Boston, where Lloyd is Sir Frederick S. Troy Professor of English, he has helped thousands of students hear the timeless messages expressed in great literature. As a critic, he has helped a vast audience discover the drama and emotion conveyed in classical music. As a poet, he has given voice to other people, letting their views and experiences shape his lyrics and monologues. Lloyd understands the importance of technique and practice, but he emphasizes the need for art to convey a shared emotional core. That core, he says, gives art its power, and it distinguishes good writing from great. You may have heard Lloyd's commentary on NPR's Fresh Air. And if you ride the red line in Boston, you might have seen his poem Crossword displayed in trains throughout the month of September. Lloyd will read that poem today. I'm delighted to have him here. Delightful to be here. Thank you for asking me. It's a pleasure. And you are going to read that wonderful poem right. for us I that thousands and thousands have seen this month. Goodness. Yes. It's very <laughs> startling to hear that about poetry, that thousands of people see it. <laughs> very exciting. So this is, this is the poem. Uh, it's called Crossword uh, for David. You're doing a crossword. I'm working on a puzzle. Do you love me enough? What's the missing word? Do I love you enough? Where's the missing piece? Yesterday I was cross with you. You weren't paying enough attention. You were cross with me. I wasn't paying enough attention. Our words crossed. Where's the missing pieces? Sorry. That's okay. Just start it again. Can I start it again? We'll edit it out. Can you edit it mm -hmm. out? Crossword for David. You're doing a crossword. I'm working on a puzzle. Do you love me enough? What's the missing word? Do I love you enough? Where's the missing piece? Yesterday, I was cross with you. You weren't paying enough attention. You were cross with me. I wasn't paying enough attention. Our words crossed. Where are the missing pieces? What are the missing words? Yet last night, we fit together like words in a crossword. Pieces of a puzzle. Mm. I love that poem because it is so easy to hear and understand. You feel that moment and you hear those voices. And one of the reasons the poem is both inviting and yet complex in a wonderful way is because of the rhythm. And rhythm in your work is deeply connected to voice. Tell us a little bit about that. Um. I, when I first fell in love with poetry, I was a senior in high school. I had a great teacher, and we read wonderful poems, and they actually meant something. And I was very excited about it, and I wanted to write something, too. Never had any ambition about being a poet in, in, mm -hmm. in, at that time, but I wanted to write something. But Boy, I knew that what I 
what I could write wasn't going to be like Keats or Robert Frost or any of the poems, Shakespeare, any of the poems that we're reading. So I had to write something in my own voice. And it was a kind of mock poem, a kind of unpoetic poem. And some years later, really after I graduated from college and I was really very, you know, serious about writing poems and I tried to write very poetic poems and I was writing poems based on characters and images in the Odyssey, sonnets and all sorts of very literary things. But something happened after college and I started writing poems in the voices of characters, different people. Some of them were real, some of them were completely made up. But in a way, here I am, I'm a graduate student in, in English and I could see, I could defend myself by saying, well, that's what Chaucer did in Canterbury Tales and it's what Robert Browning did and Robert Frost wrote monologues and Elizabeth Bishop and Robert Lowell, my fav some of my favorite poets. And that these poems had to be in a convincing, natural, colloquial voice. And, um, and that really changed my whole attitude towards my own poetry. That and that the work I do in revision and, you know, I, I would be very happy if people think my poems are absolutely effortless and they just sort of come pouring out. Uh, that's sort of what I want them to seem, to have that kind of spontaneity. But, in fact, it takes a lot of work to make the poems seem spontaneous and really colloquial and that just mimicking ordinary conversation is not enough for a poem. That the poems, that every syllable has to count and there has to be a kind of rhythm in the way the lines come out. Uh, and um, if, it, if the poem doesn't have that, it's just gonna go flat the way you know most conversations do. You don't want them recorded or you don't really want to remember every syllable of, of a conversation that you've just had. But if you're going to put it down in a poem, it has to have, there has to be something tight and controlled about that to balance the conversational tone of the language, the colloquial language, the, the not fancy poetic mm -hmm. language. And I think there's a real poetry in in speech and in conversation, mm -hmm. but it has to be controlled about. So I am not acting and I'm teaching at night, but I'm still writing poems or want to write poems. And I suddenly start, I get this idea about writing a poem in someone else's voice, which I had never done before. All my poems up until that point were lyric poems, you know, expressing my emotions, my sorrows, my, you know, all that stuff. And I suddenly started writing poems in the voices of, of other people, of characters, although some of them were real. Some of the real people were characters uh, in themselves. And I never, at the time, I didn't make that connection between not acting and writing poems that were about characters. But certainly in retrospect, I see that as a very obvious transition. What did it mean to me to be an actor? And partly it meant getting away from myself. Partly it meant expanding myself, doing something on the stage, playing a fool or a villain or you know, something that probably wouldn't happen in, in real life. And, and kind of enlarging my own possibilities. And I, I think most actors feel this double thing. And then 
all of a sudden, really without thinking about it, that's what I was doing in my poems. And the very first poem that I wrote in someone else's voice also got to be the first poem that was published, you know, in a, in a serious way that wasn't in a student publication. And I thought, well, maybe I'm onto something. Mm -hmm. And I started writing these monologues and, and some dialogues. Um, people would say to me, oh, have you ever written a play? And I didn't want to write plays. I wanted to write poems. But there was certainly some dramatic, if not theatrical, element in, in these poems that I, was, that I was writing. And my very first book was called These People. And it was this series of mo monologues and dialogues in the voices of people who were not me and sometimes very different from me. Mm -hmm. What you said about acting, giving people a way to escape but also to expand their experience is very true of poetry as well. Right. And it's interesting that you channeled your love of acting onto the page. And by doing that, you give readers a new way of experiencing words. That's one of the interesting threads in your life. But there's another interesting <laughs> thread, and that is music. Right. You didn't set out to become a music critic. I certainly didn't. And in some ways, you got a big boost from serendipity. Because to explain your story in brief, you had the opportunity to write a couple of reviews for the Boston Herald. The Correct. paper loved those reviews. You started reviewing regularly. When the Herald stopped running those pieces, you then applied for a full-time position at the Phoenix. At the Phoenix. Yeah. So serendipity definitely helped you out, but I think it's also the voice in your reviews. Tell me about voice in a review. Yeah. Well, it's true that I, you know, I'm not a musicologist. I'm not a musician. I don't play an instrument. I did when I was five years old for a very short time. Didn't love doing that. Um, but I do love music, and I had a passion for music when I was from, from a very early age. And I was very lucky when I was a graduate student, even when, when I was an undergraduate, to have friends who loved music and would go to concerts and listen to records and talk about them and discuss mm -hmm. them. And I thought, well, that's what I could do, mm -hmm. that I was not someone who could just, you know, who could say, this is right, this is wrong, and, and kind of pontificate as a kind of nasty word, but that I wasn't... I wasn't an expert, as you said, in, in, in that way. That I was a member of the audience who maybe was a little more intense than most people in the audience, who had this great opportunity to express my feelings about the music that I heard, my opinions, certainly, very opinionated, absolutely. And, and that to do that as a member of the audience, and, and that I think of my reviews now that, you know, I've been doing this for such a long time, but I think about doing those reviews as have, it's my side of a conversation that I'm having with my reader. Mm -hmm. Or, and I'm so lucky to be, to have, you know, to be on fresh air, where there's a real listener and where I could say, you know what, I, you, you want to hear what I'm talking about? Listen, listen to this. And I can actually play the music, which of course I can't do if I'm writing for a newspaper. Yeah. Um, but it's really, that's, that's part of it. You're, and you're absolutely right. It is, it is a voice that, I, I, that I, I want to be part of this conversation. And I want my reviews to be not exactly authoritative, but natural and involved and caring about 
in the discussion, caring about what I've just seen or, or, or heard. Mm -hmm. By having a non-traditional voice as a reviewer, you help your audience hear the voice in the music. And by doing that, you give the audience their own voice, their own way of thinking about and expressing their feelings about the music. What makes me smile is that you have used a classic tool of poetry to make those reviews sing and help the audience connect with what you're expressing. Tell us about that. Well, one of the interesting things that I learned about myself from my own reviews is that because as, as we talked about, my poems are not very poetic. They're more vocal than imagistic. What I, found, what I discovered in, in talking about music on the page was that I actually did have a gift for imagery. Because if you can't talk about music technically, or don't want to, for me it was both, uh, how else do you talk about what you've experienced, what you've heard, except through images? And then I found that I, I actually could do that. And, um, and, uh, and do that more in my, in my reviews than in my poems. And in fact, there's, there was one review that I wrote uh, of a symphony performance and the conductor who really struck me as doing strange and interesting things, that, that the, the, the review was so imagistic that I thought, you know, someday I think I might actually turn this review into a poem. And, and I did that. It's the only time I've ever done that, but I, I, uh, it was something that I, uh, that I did at least on that one occasion. Mm -hmm. You started out using imagery as a way to connect with the audience right. and to help them connect with the music. Now that you have been reviewing for years, and you were very good at it. You won the Pulitzer. Do you still? Amazing. <laughs> I'm still amazed. Do you still use imagery in the same way in your re reviews? Yes. It it just it just seems. I think it's just a kind of natural thing that you know that I think I know more about music. I know more about. I've learned a lot about music since I've started to write about it. But I, it's still the it's still a way of it's it's still really the basic way that I know of conveying what I'm what I'm hearing, uh, I, it, it, and it just it feels very natural to me to 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 do that in in, in my reviews. Mm -hmm. What is the writing process like with a review as compared to a poem? Huh. Well, with a review, first of all, there's a deadline. Mm -hmm. So no delaying, no procrastination. You have to write it and you have to get it in. When I was writing for the Herald, I had to, an hour and a half to write a review. Mm -hmm. The review had to be in by midnight, the night of the performance. Now, in fact, almost no, pa no newspapers do that anymore. Mm. When I started writing for the Phoenix, I had a week, but there was still a deadline, and fresh air, I kind of make my own deadlines, but, you know, if I have, if I'm scheduled to record a review, it, the review has to be written <laughs> by the time I, I do that. So there is, I am able to do that. It's not a hardship, it's a challenge, and it's mm. kind of exciting. Uh, to be able to do that. With poems, I'm a very bad role model for my students because I am not someone who sits down for an hour or two hours or a half an hour or 15 minutes every day and practices writing poems, works on a poem. I wait, I will wait as long as I can, can to put off doing this and the poem just at some point takes over my life 
and then everything else gets shoved out of the way and I'm obsessed with working on the poem, trying to finish the poem, and then it may be a long time before I write another poem, or sometimes another poem will just happen right away. Mm -hmm. But it kind of, for me, it's the poem that takes over, and it's not something that mm -hmm. I'm planning to do. And that, that can be very inconvenient, <laughs> uh, because I have a mm -hmm. life to live, and I have deadlines, and I'm teaching, and, and I can't just stop everything mm -hmm. and write a poem, though I would love to, or I think I would love to. Mm -hmm. um, but that's, that's the process. And then, um, and I'm a you know, relentless reviser, and, and because so many of my poems are, are in a kind of colloquial voice, I want to be sure that that voice comes alive on the page. Mm -hmm. So I'm very interested in, and I would say obsessed again, with punctuation, hmm. with spacing, with mm -hmm. line breaks to get inflection to make the plain language come alive in some way, or at least come alive in my own, in my own head, mm. to see, to look at what I've written on the page and, 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 and see if I can hear it the way I hear, that I hear it in my mind. Mm -hmm. You do a beautiful job of sort of getting out of the way of the poem and removing any impediments to the voice of the poem. You really hear it. And in the end, the poems end up sounding very much like you. I can always tell a Lloyd poem <laughs> Because it does. It oh, sounds so much like you, that's and, great. and that's not the case with most poets. You have very distinctive work. There are so many voices that you channel and you bring to life. What was the voice in your mind when you found out that you would win the Pulitzer? Oh my gosh. I just, I couldn't believe it. I was actually interrupted by the department secretary in the middle of one of my poetry classes uh, and said that, you know, there are some reporters who are trying to reach you and they're here and someone wants to take your picture. And I'm thinking, why? You know? She said, well, I think you won something. <laughs> and I was just flabbergasted. I was also writing for a weekly and weekly newspapers there, there was really kind of prejudice by the Pulitzer committees and foundations against weekly newspapers. Almost every Pulitzer Prize in journalism had gone to someone who wrote for a daily newspaper. And the only, the only Pulitzer Prize before mine that ever went to someone who worked for a weekly newspaper was to Jules Pfeiffer, who's car who won for his cartoons in the in the Village Voice, mm. and I, and I was really the first kind of you know writer writer um, who got a Pulitzer for for writing for a weekly newspaper, uh, and I was also after I won I was a judge. Uh, for a couple of years, and I fought very hard for for some people who wrote for weeklies, not the Phoenix, but for other weeklies. And uh, it was a losing battle uh, because the prejudice was so strong against that. Other writers for weeklies have won in the in the last twenty years, but it took a while. But you open the door for um, another kind of distinctive voice. Someone, someone mm -hmm. opened the door. Some, some judges were sympathetic, and, and I'm very grateful to them. Well, and we are very grateful to you for your criticism, your poems, just your love of language, because you help others love it as well. Believe it or not, we are almost out of time. Oh, my. Well, so would you, you read oh. the poem, The Conductor? Oh, sure. This is, this is the poem uh, that was based on, on, on that review. The Conductor. Breezing easily between exotic chinoiserie and hometown hoedown, 
whisking lightly between woodwind delicacy and jazzy trombone. He must have the widest and oddest repertoire of gestures, which allows him a stylistic and dynamic range unusual even among today's most highly regarded conductors. The way he slipped from the grandiose opening adagio maestoso to the sudden jaunty allegretto made me laugh out loud. Though his small, complex gesticulations can diminish and even undermine the passages where the melodic lines ought to soar. He's all dippy knees, flappy elbows, and floppy wrists. Not Bernstein's exaggerated self-immolation, but little complicated pantomimes, steering a car down a winding road, patting down a mud pie, robbing eggs from a bird's nest and carrying them carefully away, flinging tinsel on a Christmas tree. As a baseball umpire, he could declare a runner simultaneously safe and out at home plate. He threw himself into the music and very nearly into the first violin section with the kind of reckless abandon that comes only with complete confidence and authority. Not so much confidence in himself and authority over his players, but confidence in his players and authority over his material. These glittering performances, more dazzle than warmth, more brilliance than magic, sophistication without innocence. Does the music ever hold surprises even for himself? Or terrors? How much would we love him if it did? Mm. Thank you for your confidence and authority. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Mm -hmm.